Welcome to the Science of Measurement, Using Test Standards to Increase Research Validity. I'm Joan Herman from UCLA Test, and also honored to be the chair of the Standards Management Committee. I'm here with uh, my two colleagues uh, who uh, form the rest of the Management Committee uh, to talk to you about why we think <clears throat> the standards for educational and psychological testing are important for research. So let me set some context. The last decade has witnessed enormous interest and attention to increasing the rigor of research and to very sophisticated designs, uh, to privileging experimental designs, to more sophisticated methodologies. Uh, meanwhile, technology has given us new ways to measure human capability and human competency. But oddly, attention to the quality of the measures we use in our research, we think, I think, I won't speak for my colleagues, have gotten short shrift. We think this is an important problem, because if your measures aren't right, what is the validity of your findings? Very limited. So we want to talk to you today, as I said, about uh, why we think the standards are important. Uh, the session, I'll start off the session talking about the quality of existing measures using a little case study from a national, uh, from a recent NRC study. We'll then move to the need for test validity evidence and research, examples from the literature by my colleague Frank Worrell from the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, and then Linda Cook from ETS will present developing and selecting quality instruments for research, the role of the fairness standards. And then we're very pleased to have with us as discussants Peggy Carr from NCES and Larry Hedges from Northwestern University. So before we get into the grist of the session, a brief overview to the standards themselves. And I want to point out the purpose of the standards. They're not intended to be a step-by-step -step guide about how to develop assessments. What they're intended it are as is criteria for the development and evaluation of tests and testing practice and guidelines for evaluating the validity of score interpretations for intended uses, and I'll add because of fairness concerns, the validity of inferences for all students within the testing population. So let me give you a brief overview to the um, table of contents. It starts with the foundation validity, reliability, precision, and fairness in testing. These are the fundamental standards that guide all subsequent sections as well. We then move to chapters that uh, deal with the nitty-gritty operations of uh, assessment programs, and then finally provide examples of applications and standards that should guide uh, testing uh, in, in the psychological uh, arena, workplace testing and credentialing, uh, educational testing, and uh, the use of tests in policy program evaluation and accountability and the like. But what I want to emphasize is the trinity of concepts that the standards, as I said, consider foundational for sound assessment. Reliability, I'm sure you know, reflects the consistency and your precision and accuracy of the scores. I'm sure you know that reliability is necessary but not sufficient for validity. <laughs> Where, and validity uh, measures, evaluates the extent to which a measure provides accurate inferences for its intended purpose. And fairness, which the 2014 standards, the most recent version of the standards brought to the fore, um, is the extent to which the meaning of score inferences is the same for all students in the testing population and is not influenced, is not unfairly uh, uh, influence the scores of, uh, for some individuals because of uh, characteristics or abilities that are unrelated to the construct of interest. So my colleagues uh, 
Frank and, and Linda will go further into depth about uh, the meaning of the uh, fairness standards and the validity standards after I speak. So, this fairness, validity, and reliability, and the quality of the evidence that's used in the research literature, because we're researchers, right, is a topic I want to address now. Um, what is the quality of the measures in research? I'm going to draw on a recently completed study from the National Research Council, National Academies, um, on uh, the role of intra and interpersonal skills and their assessment in supporting students' college success. As part of that study, we based our um, analysis of the strength of evidence based on intervention studies uh, about the eight uh, competencies we identified, interpersonal competencies that we identified as important for student success. Um, there were 49 such studies, and so I'm using these 49 studies, since we did a close analysis of them, as examples of the quality of research. These are gold star um, studies. Um, but when we look at the quality of the evidence, we look simply, did they document reliability, validity, fairness? Here's what we found. And unfortunately, you can't see that. Don't you just hate that when people say that? <laughs> I know I do. But if you could read it, what you would say, see is that in most of the studies, they did provide evidence of reliability. Yay, we learned that. Um, but when you look at actually the reliability indices, they range from sort of low mediocre to quite high, the whole range. When you look at the extent to which we found any evidence of validity of the measures of these identified construct, we found one study that documented any validity evidence. And when we looked at the extent to which there might be evidence of fairness documented in the reports of the studies, at least the reports we looked at, zero. Now, this doesn't mean that the, these tests were, or instruments were invalid or were terrible. It doesn't mean they were unfair. It just means we have no clue whether the extent to which they're valid, the extent to which they're fair. I should note as well that there were, we did find assessments outside of this pool of studies that did pay attention to validity. And strangely enough, those tended to be assessments whose development and validation was specially funded. Those people did a better job of documenting uh, the validity, at least. Um, but it was only when we went to um, measures developed by ETS and ACT that we found attention to the trinity of all three. So based on our analysis, uh, we, we recommended that uh, higher education uh, researchers, policymakers, and everyone else pay more attention to the reliability, validity, and fairness of their measures. And we particularly underscored um, the importance of fairness. As I said, we were dealing with the domains of inter and intrapersonal skills. And fairness is, a, a, while it's important, of course, across all types of measures, is particularly crucial, I think, in, in assessing these kinds of competencies or predispositions, because there may be cultural differences in how these kinds of competencies exhibit themselves. So we particularly underscore the recommendations that researchers and practitioners in higher education should consider evidence on fairness during the development, selection, validation uh, of intra and interpersonal competency assessments. And that is where I'm going to stop because that 
gives you a little overview, a non-rigorous study, a convenience of sample, nonetheless, gold standard studies that um, perhaps could pay more attention to the standards for educational and psychological measurement. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Frank. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, I'm very uh, delighted to be here. And I'd like to say, as I begin, um, since I didn't get my new slides in on time, uh, <laughs> thanks to Dr. Dante Dixon for his assistance with some of the information of this presentation. Um, he's a former student of mine, also thanks to him for me being here because I was supposed to be on a conference call at this point in time. I put the wrong thing on my electronic calendar. I have this session for tomorrow morning. Yeah. And uh, if he had not sent me a screenshot <laughs> when I said, well, I'll be doing X, he said, no, you won't. <laughs> you should be um, somewhere else. Um, so I'm glad to be here. Um, and so my talk is on the need for test validity evidence in research. And, uh, and I, I'm hoping that, in fact, that need will become um, quite clear by the end of, uh, of this presentation. And so, in, in short, I'm going to do a, a very brief high overview of, of, of um, the application of the standards and the rationale for applying the standards to research instruments. I'm going to draw two examples from the literature, um, grit and metacognition, um, and then offer some conclusions. And I want to say that I, I just chose grit and metacognition as, as two examples. Um, I, uh, I could have drawn examples from racial identity, growth mindset. There are a number of areas um, where I think research has now become important in making decisions without paying enough attention to validity. So the purpose of the standards, you know, uh, as, as, as indicated, right, is to provide criteria for the development and evaluation of tests and testing practices and guidelines for assessing the validity of the interpretations of those scores for their intended uses, right? And as the standards note that these guidelines are intended for professional test developers, publishers and so forth, which typically does not include researchers, right? Um, although the standards do go on to indicate that the demarcation between professional tests and other tests um, is sometimes a little difficult to understand. One of the things that several of the chapters have in the first two sections of the book is an overarching standard, and, and the one for validity, I think, is important to articulate. Right? That, each, that there should be a clear articulation of each intended test score interpretation for a specific use. So that should be set forth, and there should be appropriate validity evidence in support of each intended interpretation. So that's where we start. The validity chapter um, has three clusters of standards. The first cluster, establishing intended uses and interpretations. There are seven standards in that section. Cluster two, issues regarding samples and settings used in validation. There are three standards. And specific forms of validity evidence. I think there are seven standards, which is missing from this slide, but it was on mine in my other section. Uh, the beauty of technology. Um, so, generally accepted conventions, I said, the standards do not apply to research instruments. Why should this change? Well, how many of you have heard of the construct grid. Now, let me ask another question. How many of you have heard of this construct in a research article or heard about it on NPR? Let's say, let's say NPR, the popular media, read about it in the press and stuff, right? So what has happened is that in point of fact, stuff that, is the, that we think of as research has now entered the public domain. And more than that, it has entered the policy domain. Right? And so that becomes an important thing. So in the rest of my presentation, I'll focus on, on, on clusters one and three, specific forms of validity evidence, and establishing intended uses and interpretations. This doesn't say that um, issues regarding samples are not important. But typically, when we are doing research, right, unless we're doing a nationally representative study or federally funded or something like that, we are often using samples of convenience. And so that, in fact, sampling issues, I mean, we know um, the, 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 the mantra, at least in psychology, which is my discipline, that much of what we know comes from undergraduates, <laughs> right? The undergraduate psych pool. And so, that, you know, but the expectation is that these are research studies that are going to be replicated elsewhere. 
and so I'm going to be focusing on clusters 1 and 3. There are multiple sources of, of course, validity evidence, test content, response processes, internal structure, relations to other variables, and so forth. And we're going to talk about some of these um, in more depth, right? Points that I made before, why we should pay attention. Research is not regularly summarized in the media. Researchers often write popular press books about their research. Um, I, we have a book that came out that we think is actually wonderful, and everybody who reads it tells us how wonderful it is, but it's written for researchers, and we've not sold, sold many copies. Um, unlike Grit or Growth Mindset and a number of other books that are out there for the general public, maybe we should do that. Um, the general public and decision makers at many levels now have access to research findings in a way that is really unprecedented. Um, from Twitter, you know, and so forth, I know um, there are several journals now that require you to write a tweet so that they can tweet when the article is published. Um, um, uh, and, and, and the research findings that are written for the public written for the public are now informing public policy rather than the research that's coming out of labs in journals. So let's turn to um, an example, GRIT. So GRIT defined as perseverance and passion for accomplishing long-term goals. And I think everybody here in this room, um, certainly those of us who are academics, know that, 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 some, that persistence and passion for accomplishing long-term goals is something that in fact probably matters. If you, you know, those of you who are assistant professors working towards tenure, keep going at it, <laughs> right? So, and, and it's joined a long list of non-cognitive, or what I prefer psychosocial variables, I don't think they're non-cognitive. It's joined a long list of psychosocial factors that, that, that we are studying, many of which have a long history of research evidence, validity evidence, self-concept, self-efficacy, delayed gratification, and so forth. So, GRIP was introduced um, in 2007, Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, right, um, the grid scale scores accounted for 4% of the variance in success outcomes on average. That's from the study. It co correlated with conscientiousness at 0.77. Um, and individual differences in grid accounted for statistically significant incremental variance in success outcomes. Um, effect size was not invoked um, or reported in that particular study. And they concluded, or Dr. Wood and her colleagues concluded, that future research is needed to see how grit relates to self-efficacy and other variables. So that's the research study. Now we have the media presentation, right? And so Dr. Wood has developed a grit scale. A person's grit score is highly predictive of achievement under challenging circumstances. A mm -hmm. um, West Point Cadet's grit score was the best predictor of success mm -hmm. in the rigorous summer mm -hmm. training program. Grit mattered more than intelligence, leadership, ability of physical fitness, etc. And same thing about the spelling bee. Now, a reminder that these scores accounted for 4% of the variables. <laughs> then in 2016, um, Duckwood wrote Grit, the Power of Passion and Perseverance. And what matters in making it through West Point's summer training? Quote, what matters is grit. What matters in Chicago public schools and for adults earning MBAs, PhDs, MDs, and JDs, and in the Green Berets, quote, regardless of specific attributes and advantages that help someone succeed in each of these diverse domains of challenge, grit matters in all. Oh. So we have then two presentations of this construct that are very much at odds. We have a research study which says it accounts for 4% of the variance and that more research is needed. And then we have a lot of presentations that, in fact, the public knows, the policy makers know, that are saying that grit is the best thing since sliced bread. Um, I guess I'm dating myself with that statement. I'm green, oh, you know, I, I'm not green yet. My younger brother is greyer than I am. Uh, I, my dad is greyer, and I got that. Um, and anyway, so in a series of studies, these are several small scale studies, you can see that. When we look at, in fact, grit, and this is predicting our uh, perceived ability, so we see that grit is not adding much variance at all, <coughs> less than 1%. Um, when we look at the reporting self-reported GPA, it's again adding about 1%. So that's a general sample. We look, one of the things that grit, in fact, has been said to be particularly useful maybe in um, addressing the achievement gap issues. So looking at an African-American sample, and what do we find? It's not adding variance at all. That in fact, 
when we can, after controlling for age and sex, the, um, you know, the psychosocial factors in this, including grit, are not adding any variance. So there is a hypothesis that, in fact, the interest factor is a suppressor factor. So taking that out of the equation, we see the same thing, that the perseverance factor is not adding any variance at all. Um, and so uh, when we put in um, other variables, growth mindset is in this model. Again, the same thing. And in a meta-analysis that's in press in general personality and social psychology, and I'm sorry, you can't see those slides. I, didn't, I can't see them here, I don't. Um, but what I can tell you is that the row, so this is a meta-analysis, and so we have actually the, the correlation, the population correlation, both for peer-reviewed studies, publications, and non-peer-reviewed investigations, that the value of row is below 0.2 in each study. It does not press <coughs> point. This one you can't see either, but what I will say is that those highlighted things, this is from the meta-analysis, they are all in the 0.01 to 0.04 range across a variety of indicators. So, credit all in fact included that in aggregate our results suggest that interventions designed to enhance grit may only have weak effects on performance and success, that the constant validity of grit is in question. That being said, we have spent millions of dollars over the last seven, uh, 10 years, decade, that GRIT has been in the literature, creating GRIT schools and GRIT-focused interventions, mm. right, on the basis of 4% of the variance. I wish that I got funded at that level. With <laughs> anyway, that, that, that's another one. So I'll turn to another uh, investigation that we have underway. This is metacognition. And again, metacognition is something that we all know about, and it's typically seen as an important construct for doing well academically. Right? And so it's 35 years of research. Currently, there's one scale in the literature, the Junior Metacognition Awareness Inventory, that measures both knowledge of cognition and regulation of cognition. Right? Decently reliable scores. So, in a paper that's currently under review, we have looked at this, and the reliability estimates are not bad 0.7 to 0.8. Um, and so, so it seems at least decent. And even though you can't make out the ending, if you can see the bold in the fact the structure looks decent as well. So we have internal <coughs> consistency of the scores, the structural validity. But when we look at actually concurrent or predictive validity, we are finding that there is really no relationship. And in fact, problematically, when we look at knowledge, knowledge is predicting negatively, while the um, regulation is predicting positively. So when, in fact, you combine the scores, you are getting, in fact, um, they're canceling out effects. And so this, in fact, has been used to say that metacognition actually does not really predict achievement as much decades of research has suggested. But in a follow-up study, in the same study, in another sample, what we did is we actually did problem-solving interviews. So we measured metacognition using problem-solving interviews and identified individuals who were low and high. Right Now, Interesting enough, under regulation and knowledge on those scores, there are no differences. Very small effects are. But when we look at GPA, both in regular school and in the gifted program in which um, we were studying students, when we look at problem solving accuracy, all of those things, there are medium to large effect sizes on, um, for, for, um, between the students who are low in metacognition and those who are high, even though we are not seeing them on the scale, the scale, the metacognition scale. So, this is a, a slide I just threw in because um, I didn't get that my new slides. I would recommend to many of you, um, Jerry Benson um, has a 1998 um, article on um, developing con a, a, an example of construct validation. And he talks about three, uh, yeah, three areas, right? That there's the substantive stage where you're doing theory um, building, you're looking at your theory, you're doing item development. There's a structural stage where you're doing internal consistency, structural validity work. And then there's a third stage, the external stage. And it seems to me that what we often do in research instruments is we do stages one and two. And then when we get to stage three, we think our instruments are already working and we start making inferences on the basis of it without establishing the validity in that external stage as a third step before doing um, information. So in conclusion, 
Psycho social constructs are potentially quite important, I think, in predicting achievement. Um, the operationalization of these constructs, the evolved research studies are being used to make educational policy decisions. And if we are going to do that, use them in these high stakes decision making, we then need to hold them to the same standards of the whole commercial test too. Um, and that's my, that's my topic. Thank you very much. I turn it over now. spend a little bit of time talking to you about um, the role of the fairness standards in the development and the selection of quality instruments um, for educational research. Now, um, I just want to make it clear from the beginning, by research instruments, what I'm referring to um, uh, this morning is the standardized tests that are developed by test publishers um, and that are often used to gather information for um, educational and psychological research. And what my goal is uh, this morning is to help you understand the guidance that I believe the fairness standards provide to anyone who's interested in using the results um, from these tests in their research. So I'm going to start uh, by talking about um, uh, how as educational researchers, our perspectives on fairness have really evolved and how this evolution is reflected in the most recently published version of the joint standards. And the next one I'm going to do is spend some time uh, talking about the specific set of fairness standards that appear in the uh, fairness and testing chapter that's included in the um, 2014 version of the um, joint standards. So, because I don't have a lot of time this morning, um, I'm going to talk mostly about changes in perspectives and fairness that have occurred in the past 15 years. And um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on comparing um, the fairness perspectives that are presented in the 1999 standards and with the fairness perspective that's presented in the uh, 2014 standards. So, um, you may not, or you may be aware, that the most recent version uh, of the standards that was published in 2014 represents the fifth edition of the joint standards. The first edition of the standards for educational and psychological testing was published by AERA and APA and NCME. Um, in 1966, and then revisions have been published in uh, 74, in 85, in 99, and then in um, 2014. Uh, the 99 standards really um, reflected um, evolutionary, evolutionary changes in the field um, that um, of education and educational and psychological testing um, that occurred since the publication of the 85 standards. One important change was the introduction of a new way of thinking about test constructs. And um, just to quote the um, introduction section of the 99 standards, um, we depart from some historical uses of the term construct, which reserve the term for characteristics that are not directly observable, but which are inferred from interrelated set of sets of observations. This historical perspective invites confusion. While well, any of you who sort of lived through that period recognize how confused definition of constructs was at that point and how it impacted researchers. Anyway, the 99 standards went on to explain that they used the term construct more broadly to describe the concept or characteristic that a test is designed to measure. And that um, has lasted through, um, uh, through this uh, revision, uh, the 2014 revision, and has really served as well. Um, the 99 standards introduced some major changes in the way that we think about validity. Um, these standards replaced the then common practice of referring to different types of validity um, with references to different lines of validity evidence that serve in the interpretation of test scores. I think this is a really important point to note um, because the 99 standards treated the concepts of validity and reliability as functions of the interpretations of test scores rather than of the test itself. And this evolving concept of validity and reliability set the stage then for future conceptualizations of test fairness also as a function of score interpretations and use as well. And that's what's reflected in the 2014 standards. The 99 standards did not include um, 
um, standards that associated with bearing specifically with the treatment of the test construction, administration, and the documentation process. Um, rather, fairness was treated as a separate aspect of testing, and the fairness chapter was included with two distinct chapters about testing specific subgroups of the population, individuals with disabilities and individuals with diverse uh, linguistic backgrounds. The format of the 99 standards was reflective, I believe, of common practice at that time, and that is that fairness was, fairness was mostly thought of as something that was really evaluated after the fact, rather than as a key concept. Um, a key concept in testing that must be addressed in the very first steps of test design, and then throughout the entire testing practice. The committee that prepared the 2014 revision of the Joint Standards was given a specific set of charges to consider when they revised the treatment of fairness. And the committee was significantly influenced um, by the first of this list of charges, and that was in addressing fairness for all examinees. To address this charge, the committee reorganized the standards by combining the standards from three chapters found in the 99 version of the Joint Standards, Chapter 7, Fairness in Testing and Test Use, Chapter 9, Testing Individuals with Diverse Linguistic Backgrounds, and Chapter 10, Testing Individuals with Disabilities. All three of these chapters were combined to form a single chapter, Fairness in Testing, that appeared in the 2014 standards. Now, the purpose of combining the three chapters was to reflect the charge to the Joint Committee that emphasized accessibility and fairness for all test takers. The committee thought that by combining um, the three chapters, a strong statement was made that fairness concerns apply to everyone in the testing population, that these concerns need to be considered in all aspects of testing, and not just be isolated in separate chapters that focus on specific populations. Another important change, um, or other important changes that were made to the fairness chapter were the differentiation between accommodation and modification, and the emphasis on the use of um, the principles of universal design um, for, test, um, for test design and test development. Now, two important format changes that were made to the 2014 standards um, were um, the first change um, that was um, was that an overarching standard um, was um, uh, provided for each of the chapters um, that were found in parts one and two of the volume. And the purpose of the overarching standard is to provide each chapter with an organizing concept. The second change was to gather the standards, as Frank referred to earlier, um, in the chapters into theme-based clusters. And these two changes have helped reduce, I think, redundancy, um, but also to make the individual standards hopefully easier to think about, and easier to talk about, and to communicate about. Now, the overarching standard um, for the fairness and testing chapter is um, all steps in the testing process, including test design, validation, development, administration, and scoring procedures, should be designed in such a manner as to promote valid score interpretation for the intended uses for all examinees in the intended population. The overarching standard really represents the most significant change in thinking about fair testing since the publication of the 99 standards. The vision of fairness described in this standard is one of a foundational component of testing that's broad and fundamental, um, as broad and fundamental as the concept of validity. This overarching standard makes it clear that fairness must be addressed in all aspects of testing and for every person who is examined um, by the test. The 20 standards found in the 2014 Fairness and Testing chapter are clustered under four major themes that cover the entire testing process. And these themes can be summarized as test design, development, administration, and scoring, uh, validity of test score interpretations for the intended use, um, accommodations to remove construct or relevant barriers, and support valid interpretations of scores for their intended uses, and finally, safeguards against inappropriate score interpretations for intended uses. Now, cluster one, which is the test design, development, administration, and scoring um, cluster, contains five standards. And the standards in this cluster emphasize that it's the responsibility of the test developer to design and develop tests that are free from construct or relevant barriers for the widest possible range of individuals, 
and subgroups in the test target population. This group of standards includes um, the introduction of two new and very important fairness concepts to the standards. The first one is the notion of accessibility, and the second is the process of universal design. Now, neither of these ideas are represented in uh, chapter seven, which was the fairness of testing and test use um, of the 99 standards. Accessibility is described in the 2014 standards as a notion that all test takers should have an unobstructed opportunity to demonstrate their standing on the construct measure um, that's being measured by the test. The 2014 standards refer to universal design as a process um, uh, that emphasizes the need to develop tests that are as usable as possible for all test takers in the intended test population, regardless of characteristics such as gender or age or language uh, background or culture or um, uh, SES or disability. The, um, the second theme that's used to cluster the standards in the various chapter of the 2014 standards is validity of test score interpretations for intended use. Now, there are three standards in this cluster, and all of them focus on the responsibility that test developers and test users have for examining the validity of score interpretations for subgroups. Evolutionary changes in thinking about test fairness are evident in the discussion of the relationship between fairness and validity that's found in this chapter. In the background section of the fairness chapter, the statements made that fairness is a fundamental validity issue and requires attention throughout all stages of test development and use. The 2014 standards highlight this important uh, fact not only by the standards that are included in the fairness chapter, but by including the standards that reference fairness issues throughout every chapter in the 2014 version, emphasizing that fairness issues are found in all testing components and, again, are relevant to all examinees that are being tested. Now, there are six standards found in cluster three, which is a cluster that focuses on accommodations to remove construct irrelevant barriers and support valid interpretations of scores for their intended uses. Although the standards found in the uh, fairness chapter emphasize the use of universal design, and that is the need to minimize barriers um, to test content and testing procedures by considering the widest possible range of test takers throughout the test design, development, and administration procedure, they recognize that some <coughs> test takers still, may still need changes um, or adaptations to the test or testing procedures before they can demonstrate their skills or abilities on the constructs that are measured by the test. So, unlike the 99 standards that designate all changes um, as modifications, the 2014 standards reflect the evolution of language in the field by differentiating between two types of test changes, accommodations and modifications. The use of the term modification in the 99 standards for all test changes, I believe, reflects a general wariness of any departures from standardized procedures in the testing process, as well as a lack of experience with the outcomes from these departures. In contrast, the standards found in the Fairness Chapter in the 2014 standards reflect the evolution of the treatment of both individuals with disabilities and those with um, diverse linguistic and cultural backgrounds. That's occurred over the past 15 years. Um, current practice differentiates between accommodations and modifications by noting that accommodations are changes to the test and testing process that do not change the construct um, that's measured by the test. But modifications, however, are changes to the contrast and testing process that do change the construct. However, they may be necessary in many instances. The 2014 standards also provide a new way to think about modifications. Um, they think about, I think, the following statement, which can be found in the comments section for standard 3.9, um, is helpful in thinking about this. Test modifications that change the construct that the test is measuring uh, may be needed for some examinees to demonstrate their standing on some aspect of the intended construct. If an assessment is modified to improve access to the intended construct for designated um, individuals, then the modified assessment should be treated like a newly developed assessment that needs to adhere to the test standards for validity, reliability, precision, fairness, so forth. I think this change um, in approach is really significant, first of all, because it does permit changes that may uh, stray a little from the standardized procedures um, to allow some 
um, measurement of some aspect of the construct for individuals. But it also provides a safety guard in that if this, um, if this standard, if standard 3.9 is followed, then there will be um, uh, some idea of what the quality of the interpretations of scores from a modified test um, um, will be, and the, the quality from those um, from the modified assessments should be fairly clearly um, established. Um, cluster four, which is safeguards against inappropriate score interpretations for intended uses, contains six standards. And the standards in this cluster caution test developers, test publishers, test users not to use um, tests when there isn't any evidence to support their use with a particular group or for a particular purpose. Now, one standard in this cluster introduces various issues that are related to opportunity to learn. Um, opportunity to learn is also covered in the background section of the Fairness Chapter of the 2014 Standards. This version of the standards refer, defines opportunity to learn as the extent to which individuals have had exposure to instruction or knowledge that affords them the opportunity to learn the content and skills that are targeted by the test. Now, treating opportunity to learn as a fairness issue is a notion that has evolved over the past decade, particularly um, as a result of the growing prominence of accountability testing in um, public school um, education. So in conclusion, what I'd like to say is um, that over the past 15 years, a number of evolutionary changes have occurred in perspectives on fairness in educational and psychological testing. And among the most important changes are, one, the notion that fairness and validity are inseparable. There are inseparable concepts of testing. Um, and that is that fairness concerns apply to everyone in the testing population and need to be considered in all aspects of testing. And then two, the introduction of the concepts of accessibility and universal design as fundamental to the testing process. Three, um, the definition and use of the terms modification and accommodation for test changes that remove construct or relevant barriers from the testing process and for the introduction of opportunity to learn as a key aspect of fairness in uh, some types of testing. So as Plake and Wise point out um, in a 2014 um, issue of Ed Measurement, and I'm quoting them, because educational and psychological testing is a dynamic field, the standards will need to be revised again and again and again. And as there will um, most certainly be a need to, uh, for the standards to be revised to reflect the changing field of educational and psychological testing. So I believe there will be a need to revise um, our perspective on what constitutes fair interpretations of test scores um, for their intended uses and um, for um, all persons in the intended uh, testing population. Thank you. or at least the topic of this session is extraordinarily important. And I'm going to give you my reason why, as a, uh, somebody who isn't primarily a psychometrician, uh, and, uh, but I want to sort of start by just giving a thin, um, well, I'm going to say thin rehash, but actually to, to say three points that I took away from the three talks, which I then want to come back to uh, in, in discussing them. The first talk showed us how little uh, validity and fairness information, in spite of the standards, uh, finds its way even to, into some of the reports, very best research reports in our field. Uh, that should be very disappointing to all of us. Uh, and I think it shows that there's a problem which uh, needs to be addressed in our field. Uh, the second presentation, in the second presentation, Frank showed us how crucial it can be that due attention to validation and to fairness, but primarily to just validity, um, how, how big a problem that can be for research that is carried out without it. And the third in the third presentation, Linda talked about 
uh, particularly the concept of fairness and how the concept of fairness as it's evolved in uh, society uh, and that evolution has sort of found its way into the psych psychometrics and assessment as a, as a way of responding to sort of more sophisticated understandings of fairness have found their way into the standards. And the, that presentation was a little more detailed than the first two, and it showed us uh, a window into how detailed and thoughtful the standards uh, are. So now, let me go back to the, the, the assertion I made at the beginning about why this, uh, why this session, I think, is very important. One of the things that's characteristic of uh, education research today is that our field is of interest to people who don't have traditional training in the kinds of things that people who get their PhDs in schools of education uh, are usually you know, subject to, uh, the kind of training they're subject to. Uh, even, in, even in pretty good schools of education, uh, the idea that everybody takes a course on measurement uh, is, not, is no longer universal. There are good schools of education that have no courses in measurement and no real opportunity to learn about the concepts and the standards beyond it, it may be something that's in a, covered in a thumbnail sense in a, in a research methods course, but the kind of deep sort of treatment of uh, validity and, and fairness uh, and reliability, which is the easiest of the three to deal with. Uh, we can't anticipate that everybody who works in our field is going to have had a thorough introduction even to the 1999 standards version of these concepts. And I think that creates a real problem. And I'm, I'm thinking here of not of people who are unsophisticated, maybe folks who are economists <coughs> or sociologists or, or statisticians uh, who just never had any training in psychometrics and certainly didn't have any training in the deeper aspects of validity or or fairness. I think that creates a, a real problem for our field, uh, which I think uh, is, um, is realized in the kinds of, of stories that, uh, that Frank told us about grit. You know, a very plausible seeming construct uh, which has sort of a, gotten a life of its own beyond, beyond the, um, the research evidence that, that there is to support it. Now, one of the things that I think is this, one of the reasons I think that we should be worried about this as education researchers is precisely because um, evidence itself is under siege in society today. Uh, and I think that anything, I think we need to be very, very vigilant uh, uh, in guarding the quality of the evidence that we produce and to distinguish between uh, what we think is high quality evidence and what we think is evidence of, of lower quality, but, uh, both in the way we interact with ourselves, but also for, even more importantly, in the, in the way we interact with society and policymakers. And I, that, that leads me to, um, uh, to link the very issues that the standards are trying to uh, address with a broader notion of questionable research practices. One of the things that uh, is currently of great interest, at least in some areas of psychology, is the idea of the research practices that psychologists use in doing their work, uh, some of which uh, have been labeled questionable research practices. That includes, at the far end of things, uh, falsifying data, and at the near end of things, um, gathering a few more cases just to make sure that you get a p-value smaller than 0.05 or rounding the p-value down uh, if you don't, um, which at that end of the scale may seem not very serious, but certainly the other end of the scale where, where we're talking about falsifying data or changing hypotheses after, after analyzing the data uh, certainly are more serious. Well, the, these, kinds of, these kinds of problems and their, their persistence in, in psychological research um, is a topic of some interest in some areas of psychology. Uh, it's certainly a topic that's of interest to the funders of, of the work uh, that psychologists do. But I don't think they're those, the, the idea of question of research practices are limited to psychology. They're certainly education researchers, uh, I'm sure, uh, participate in many of them. And I think the practice of not of using tests and, and assessments 
and not adhering to the standards created for their use uh, in our field is itself a questionable research practice that we've shown in this session has the potential to harm our field and to harm our credibility as, as researchers. So I think it's extraordinarily important for us to uh, be mindful of that. Of that. Um, I, you know, I want to I wanted to comment on one other um, uh, one other thing that uh, that the, this session really brought to my mind, and that is as I listened particularly to Linda describe the great detail uh, and, uh, and of the treatment of, of fairness in the standards. Uh, I recognized how few of my colleagues probably are aware of uh, both what's in the standards and the sort of thinking that, that, that underlies it. And I recognize that one of the things that's not enough is to produce great standards um, that are, as uh, I, think, I think Frank pointed out, addressed to other uh, psychometrically oriented researchers but to educate the rest of the field of education researchers about the standards. And I would argue that this is the kind of thing that requires a major professional development effort on the part of somebody. ABRA ought to be behind it. APA ought to be behind it. Because I think it is true that without some other efforts to get the, to get the word out, um, we aren't going to be as aware as we need to be of what appropriate research practices involving tests and assessments are. And I would go even, uh, I suspect, even further than that in sort of thinking about, well, professional development is nice, but why would anybody care? Uh, I think it would be wise if the field were to produce some incentives uh, for people to get some professional development around the area of the standards for the use of tests and assessments. And I can point out that at least one way to do that is to create uh, incentives um, by funding agencies. I mean, the National Science Foundation requires everybody to give training on ethical research practices if they're going to work on an NSF grant. Um, I know you've got plenty to do, maybe, but I, I think uh, I think it would be a great thing if IES would uh, nudge everybody doing education research to learn a little bit more about the standards. Um, of course, journals could do their bit by at least getting authors to say they. Uh, adhere to the standards. Um, I don't think that guarantees they will know what they are or will adhere to the standards, but at least it will, it's, it's a step in the right direction, and I would be, uh, I'm going to advocate that, that the Journal of Research on Educational Effectiveness, which I have a small connection, um, try and do that as a step in the right direction. And with that, I will shut up and give the floor to you. Okay, well, all of that, so um, this should be some powerful statements that I make here, but let me start out by saying that I am honored to be on this panel because we have some very distinguished uh, panelists here who work very hard in putting together these standards, and they are a game changer. I think um, they are a milestone, and I feel I think they've helped us turn the corner in a very significant way help us to think very deeply about these very complex uh, constructs. And um, I just, I, I agree with Larry that I don't think that we have really been paying attention. We've been sort of sleep at uh, the wheel here. And so I want to honor the uh, authors here. And I also want to say that Larry is sort of modest because he is the chair of my board and it's also on one of my key advisory uh, panel, so he can just tell me what to do. And <laughs> I can probably do it at IES. I wanted to to comment that one of my favorite quotes uh, in the standard says this: "It's incorrect to use the unqualified phrase the validity of the test, but so many of us do that. We still do that. It's not the test that's." valid or invalid is the use, the proper use of the test given the um, propositions and the stated uh, use of the test. And we're so guilty. 
I also wanted to comment that the 99 standards did a, a really good job of bringing uh, forth the new way of thinking about validity as a, as a unitary concept, uh, construct, in ways that, again, I think I had not thought about in my training. Uh, and, it, and it's done it in such a way that it's profound. As a professor, many times I taught uh, your courses and measurement. And as I went through the standards, again, once again, I've seen them before, but in preparation for today, I realized that I often taught these concepts of validity in sort of an isolation. They were like pieces, but not necessarily pieces of the same puzzle. And it occurred to me as I was preparing today that that has been um, an oversight. I was heartened by the focus on fairness in the standard. And I have to say that as, as a minority in this profession, one of the things that I'm often confronted with from many minority communities, African American, uh, minority community, uh, Native Americans, they're always concerned about, are these tests biased? Are, 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 how can you say to me that they're not fair when we're always scoring at the bottom. When I give a presentation in the department, there's always that ELL person that's going to ask that same question every time. Uh, how do I know that you are applying the right accommodations and have you tested for those accommodations so that they really are uh, doing their job? So I hats off to you, the authors of these standards, for putting fairness right up front and sticking it in our faces, so to speak, so that I can share with those in the community that we're paying attention to the importance of fairness and how uh, it is uh, part of every component of testing. It should be part of every component of test testing and assessment. So what I would like to do is to say a little bit about what I've heard from these three very powerful presentations today. And then I have a couple of things I want to offer on my own that made me reflect about the work that I do every day um, and offer some recommendations. Frank, let me start with you. What I thought was powerful about your presentation is that you did a really good uh, comparison of what maybe we shouldn't do versus what maybe we should do. Now, you know, we, we all love grit in the way that you describe and for unfortunately the reasons that you describe. And um, I was really taken back by the research that you pulled together to make these powerful statements. Uh, but what occurred to me, and this is in the standards very clearly, is that these studies were showing predictive validity, but they were not showing construct validity. There was little evidence of construct validity. And even before you pulled up that slide, I was thinking, there's no construct validity. Are we, in fact, measuring what we're purporting to measure? And I also thought to myself that I suspect that the scale that Duckworth put together probably is pretty reliable. Who knows what the coefficient is? But as you pointed out, Joan, something can be reliable, not, but not necessarily valid. So I compare that to what you're doing in this new study on metacognition. It's exactly the opposite. And I made some notes that I thought were pretty thoughtful uh, with regard to what you did. You build a bot. You built a body of evidence around your support. Your, these claims that you are supporting. You showed us some really nice internal consistency uh, evidence with your alphas of 0.85 overall. You even looked at the subscale, even though they were pretty small. The the reliabilities were pretty good. 0.72 and 0.81. I thought that was responsible of you. Then you showed us some factor analysis results. Granted, the eigon values for one of the subscales, they weren't that great. You couldn't see it, but I could see it. They were pretty, some of them were pretty small, but needless to say, you were, this is what the standard says, is put it all out there and show people what, what they are buying or not buying. 
the fact that you uh, attempted concurrent validity and it didn't work was also very powerful, I thought, because again, it says to your, your uh, consumer what this construct is and what it is not. And it's hard to do construct validity studies. And so to, to demonstrate that you could do this fairly um, simplistically with a discriminant, I would call it discriminant validity um, methodology, I thought was impressive. So thank you for sharing that with us. Joan, I'm not surprised that you went through 49 studies and came up short on the validity and the fairness. I could have told you that, but probably you could have too. Uh, but the standards make it very clear that those in the field of social um, psychology, of social, um, social psychological, social uh, concepts, um, we're not immune to this. And on page two of the standards, it says this, the standards applies most directly to standard measurements, such as measures of ability, aptitude, achievement, attitudes, interest, personality, cognitive functioning, and mental health, page two. So I think people know they're supposed to be doing this. They're just not doing it. Um, I personally was trained at Howard University, and there's no way those in our PhD program would have gotten away with a dissertation that did not have a really strong section on both validity and reliability. And in fact, often we did study one and study two. Well, guess what study one was? demonstrating reliability and validity if you were pulling together your own scale, or even if the scale that you were gonna use had not been uh, validated or there was not enough research with the population that you're planning to generalize it to. So I, I think we just dropped the ball. Additionally, I wanna point out, Joan, that we're gonna to have to be more um, vigilant as time goes on because ESSA, Every Student Succeeds Act has given states the opportunity to put together and send to us quality indicators such as student engagement, um, uh, teacher or school engagement, and then there's a, a, another one on school climate and safety. We even try to put the department, even try to pull together well-established measures of school climate and safety and give it to the states so that we could be uh, more confident that we were gonna get back reliable data. The states didn't bite. So, Linda, let me, I'm gonna be remiss if I don't first congratulate Linda on her award. She uh, won the 2017 uh, award, uh, Professional Career Award for for um, this year. So Linda, I know you have to run out, but I, I wanted to, to, to make sure that you heard that I heard you. That was a very uh, powerful presentation. And uh, what I can say in response is that the programs that I'm responsible for, NAEP and, and some of the international studies do a good job as well, we do a lot of those things. So we've included universal design, um, we have accommodations built into uh, our um, platforms, we do diff analysis on almost everything that you can think of, we do play groups. So as we're developing the tasks, the students actually play with the uh, uh, the uh, technology-based tasks and tells us this makes no sense or, you know, this looks pretty good and so we can revise it as we go along. We use uh, ECD. But what I was reminded of as I listened to you, Linda, is that although we do all of these things, there's always a possibility for slippage. I'm reminded of the arts assessment that we just released um, a few days ago from the National Assessment of Educational Progress. And I spoke to two reporters. There was an AP reporter, and she kept pushing me on the interpretation of the scores because we didn't have any achievement levels. 
the basic proficient and advanced that you would normally have. And she said, well, what do the scores mean, Peggy? Uh, I tried to use the item map, which you've seen before, and she just wasn't buying it. Then there was the Huffington Post that when I finally explained to her that most of the students did not uh, understand or was not able to, to get the, the responses correctly uh, on the uh, uh, assessment, and she realized that, you know, the p-value was somewhere around um, 0.4 or less. She says, well, what good is this? Are you sure that this is the right correlation between opportunity to learn and what was on the test? She didn't say it in those terms, but that's really what she was asking. So I don't have much time, but I did want to show you this. In the standards, it talks a little bit about uh, precision and how important it is to not just look at the reliability of the instrument, just the whole reliability of the instrument, but the precision along the whole distribution of the scale. And this comes from the uh, eighth grade NAEP uh, uh, assessment. And what you see here is that these are subscales. And what you see here is that mm, they're best in the middle and not so good at either ends of the distribution. And, you know, for a long time, I didn't worry about this because NAEP and the international assessments, we are group assessments. We don't really worry about reliability of students. But then when we start getting pushed on um, uh, a whole groups of students that we were not able to get on the scale or the instability of our gaps comparisons over time. And it's because these scales are so uh, poor at the bottom of the distribution where a lot of these students are, are located. So now we're going to be using MST, multi-stage testing, in order to uh, imp improve upon um, the precision. So in conclusion, uh, I say that uh, we have been ignoring uh, validity, but I think it's because validity is hard to prove. It's, it takes a lot of effort, and that uh, the standards make it very clear that this is a very serious violation. And I would also like to support the recommendations I heard from, uh, from Larry Researchers should conduct, conduct more methodological studies. What's wrong with a method study? We just don't do them like we used to. Someone needs to talk to the peer-reviewed journals, and they're, someone's letting these articles into these journals. And what about the private and public funders? Um, we need to have a talk with them as well. Two other recommendations that are not up there is that we need to have to talk with the deans of these universities because they may not know what's going on. And what about the test publications, the people who are putting out these textbooks? Because Curlinger and Penhauser, those that uh, use those texts, they don't talk about validity or fairness in the way that these standards talk about. We have a lot of work to do. So congratulations and thank you um, for this opportunity. So we save time for you. What, what do you think? What are your questions? What are your concerns, thoughts? Please. I don't know who wants to deal with with that. You you start, Frank, and then I'll I might have some thoughts as well. I think that one of the things that we really do need to think about. We've been talking about educating researchers and so forth, but I do think we need to educate the public. Um, on the one hand, we have a lot of parents who are saying that we are testing kids too much, um, and that that this is problematic. On the other hand. Any of us who has had a child or, in fact, a personal situation where we need a surgeon, we want that person to be board certified. We want our pilot to have passed the pilot's exam. So that, in fact, I think assessment serves a purpose. 
And I think that, in fact, we think we do not connect right, competencies, measuring competencies with the testing that we are doing in schools, and that's what we, that's what we need them for. Indeed, we, the reason we know about the achievement gap is because of tests. So I think we, we need to do a job of educating the public about the utility of these instruments, that they're not just being given for the sake of you know, um, making money, but they're being given so that we can, in fact, understand are we, in fact, providing the education for our students that we need to be providing. So, Frank, you took the words right out of my mouth, but I would add to the need to educate the, the public, not that I expect them to read the standards, but on the management committee, we've been thinking about um, how we can better promulgate the standards, or at least the core ideas of the standards, to a variety of different stakeholder groups. And so I would add to, to, to the people who need to be more educated, in addition to the researchers, that you guys have already done a marvelous job of, of, of supporting our interests, is educators. You know, my understanding is uh, uh, some of the, the parents being uh, resistant to, to having their kids tested also was associated with teachers being very unhappy that those test results might be used for purposes of evaluation. So we need, uh, num number one, we need tests not to feel like they're punishments, but um, number two, we, we need educators and others in, in, in dialogue with parents about why it's, that, that in fact, if they are, that these are good tests and what they will tell us and why that's important to, to know and the like. Over here, please. Thinking about the communication, I see a paradox of theory, and that is that as testing becomes more sophisticated, so does the language used by the testers become more impenetrable to others, <laughs> and their own kind of phraseology in there. Even a phrase like, constructed elements, which trips off the tongue for everybody in the room, is actually not understood by a principal or by a politician, and that there lies a problem. So as the standards become better and better, in some sense, they become more and more inaccessible. And I wonder what you can do about it. Well, so I, we're... We haven't phrased it in exactly that way, but I think we are grappling with the, with the, with the issue as sort of what, what versions of the standards might be created, for example, for teachers and administrators, for, for parents? How can we make the concepts um, accessible to a, a broader array of, of uh, stakeholders? Yeah, and, and I would add to that. I mean, I think GRIT provides a perfect example of that. I don't think that the, any parent or teacher would pot potentially like to read the JPSP article, which was written for researchers. But the translation of that into the, the, the book actually for, written for the common, for somebody who's not a researcher, and that's what we need to be able to do with, in fact, these kinds of um, issues, these technical issues. We need to be able to write those kinds of popular press manuals so that people understand what, what we're talking about and why it's important. Here, please. Uh, kind of a follow-on question to, uh, to both of those. Um, one is, what do we do about these sort of psychological zombies that refuse to die? So it seems like grit could be a rising one, but you know, people in the educational community have been dealing with multiple intelligences for years and years, right? These things that sound really good, they're very easy to grasp, but don't really seem to actually do much in terms of actually benefiting our students, which is ultimately sort of what we're trying to do. So how do we address that issue? And then sort of on an unrelated note, um, we want these standards to be accessible. We want people to use them, and yet we put them behind a $70 normal list price paywall for people who want to access them. So I understand that these are targeted at professionals, right? But at the same time, if you want standards to be utilized and widely understood, you need to make them widely available and yeah. easily accessible. So what are some thoughts about how are ways that you can have the sort of the $70 professional version, but the more easily accessible version that say you can use in a graduate student class or an undergraduate education class or in a teacher PD or whatever that you, that you might be looking at? So, okay. You want I can go a little bit out on the, 
out on the limb and say that um, you are, is this on? Can yes. You, yeah. Okay. That you are, uh, uh, that those kinds of questions you're raising to the appropriate group, um, Joan and Frank and myself, because within the confines of what our, our joint organizations, AERA, APA, and NCME will allow us to do, as the management committee, we have the opportunity now to set the direction for the next revision of the standards. And things that we're hearing are, um, are there ways to make them free, for example, um, accessible to everyone? And certainly, are, do we need multiple versions that would communicate to multiple audiences? The current standards were designed to communicate to testing professionals. Um, the fees were set to support the production of the next set of standards. Perhaps there's another way to support that. So these are all things that we need to think very seriously about as we um, initiate, um, uh, make plans for the next revision of the standards. They're good points. Could I offer a, a, a suggestion on versioning um, or different ways of communicating? One, one example that is different but illustrates having different versions was the Agency for Healthcare Quality and Research uh, early in its existence used to create clinical practice guide, research-based clinical practice guidelines in medicine. They had one version that was uh, of each guideline that was hundreds of pages and had all of the, all of the uh, research evidence and meta-analyses and all this stuff. Then there was a somewhat shorter version that was a less than 100-page document for people who were really interested, um, maybe research physicians, and then a pamphlet for <laughs> most physicians and for patients. And so um, with, tech, with the, and that was, this was 20 years ago, the new technologies that are available uh, could permit multiple different kinds of versions of that, of, of, you know, of different complexity and length. Uh, and it seems to me that's worth the investment. Yeah, that's a good idea. I, I would suggest, I was thinking uh, as we, we got these questions, I would suggest that you think about an e-version of this, mm -hmm. uh, almost like a tool that uh, allows people to search, allows people to point and click, allows different portals for different audiences mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so they can go in and find what they need. Um, that's what, so making it accessible is not just making a light version of the same paper mm -hmm. a document. I really think you need to rethink and uh, bring it into the 21st century. Yeah. I, I, but one, one of the, th that's a really good idea, but, uh, both of you. Uh, one of the things we've been thinking about is a, a, a portal um, that, w that had different areas for different stakeholders and then potentially organized around decisions yeah. each of those stakeholders had to make and then, you know, sort of pointing towards the standards that were most relevant for using evidence for that decision. Yes, in the back, please. So, so the issue isn't around differences in standing on the construct. The issue is the measurement quality for these different groups. And so if a measure uh, is highly reliable for one group but not reliable for another group, that would be important to know in interpreting the evidence for the, for the group for whom reliability was low as just one example. Um, or um, uh, a, uh, you know, a, a, a psychosocial construct um, which evidence itself in different ways in different cultures, for example, if you have, if the assessment deals with one instantiation of it, then the validity of it, if you have validity evidence about the fairness, it would be, impo it would be important to know that it's, that the evidence is stronger for validity for this group than another group, again, so that we don't draw conclusions or make inferences from test scores that are not meaningful and accurate. I would point you to um, some of the work that um, some colleagues and I have done on um, time perspective 
where, for instance, we find that uh, Zimbardo scale does not work for adolescents in the United States, but it works better for adolescents in, in the UK. Um, and so, in fact, we have a lot of comparative studies across se several different countries. And so the, I think that's exactly the point. If you want to be measuring the same construct across different groups, whether within the same national context or across different contexts, to, to make the same inferences, you've got to have the same level. The, the scores have got to have the same level of reliability, validity, and so forth, you know, at least acceptable, mm -hmm. so that you can draw the same conclusions, or you, you can't then make um, uh, use the, the, the scores the same way. Here, please. Yeah, go ahead. I'm um, uh, thank you for those comments. Um, I think it's important to recognize that the way the, the way we do this is actually based on, in fact, an engagement of the community. So, for example, when the standards, when the decision was made to revise the 1999 standards for the 2014 standards, there was a call put out very, very generally for people to comment on what's working and what's not working. And in fact, when the 2014 standards were then first done, there, was, there were two sets of comment periods that didn't just involve the organizations, APA, AERA, and NCME, but also involved the general public. And in fact, I would argue, I know, for example, um, one of the things that's getting, I think, less polarized, the idea between quantitative and qualitative research. I would argue, for example, that in fact, if we are finding, if there is um, something that we have reliability and validity for, but there's qualitative evidence suggesting that there are concerns, that those are things we need to pay attention to. So, so, and each revision of the standards then is based with an engagement with the research community. And so part of the task of the research community is not just to understand the standards and, 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 dis and perhaps use them in their work, but in fact to test that in fact the standards are doing what they're supposed to do. So, so that's uh, at least a, a, an addressing of the first part of your question. The second part about, uh, the concerns that, that parents and, and teachers may be raising about um, testing. I think we are getting into sort of, sort of, sort of epistemological differences here. Um, I live in California where we have a group of parents in our county who, don't, who believe that um, 
that vaccination causes autism, and so therefore they're not getting their kids vaccinated. And we have had an outbreak of several diseases that we had thought were eliminated. Um, and I think we are living in an age where the idea of, uh, I think Larry mentioned it, that this challenge to evidence. Now, I am, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I grew up in the church and so forth, but if my child is sick, I'm not having a priest just come and pray. I want to go to a doctor and get some medication. And I think that we need to um, recognize that there are some standards of evidence that we, have, that we think are important that people need to adhere to. And, and for me, that's an education issue. Not recognizing that people can have different differences of opinion. But, but I think we do need, in fact, to decide where we draw the line and what, where, where science starts and where belief starts and so forth. Right, I agree, <laughs> and I don't have the right answer. Okay, well, let this be the last question or comment. No. Yeah. Well, okay, F very last one. Then. Well, I mean, I think that's an, uh, if you will, another version, another stakeholder group, as a, you know, as as Linda said, and as as the uh, standards acknowledge, they they have been developed for people in the field, and they can. Although, since I wrote some of them, I think they're very accessible and easy to understand, but not everyone agrees with me. And, you know, I'm a testing person. I'm not a communications person. So, I mean, I think we, that, that, that researchers are another stakeholder group that we, I think we, for me, and I'm not speaking for my colleagues, we need to do a better job of communicating what these fundamental concepts of validity fairness and reliability are so that people get the big idea and if they, you know, and don't get caught in the, the density of the individual standards. But I, I would agree with you. Right. And this session, I mean, as a management committee, we have been thinking about these issues <laughs> for the last few months um, quite a bit. And this session came out of those thoughts and the idea of having different kinds of presentations and different kinds of versions for different stakeholders are something we are grappling with right now to work through because the, to come back to that other question, we really do need to find a way on the one hand to make them accessible to all, everybody, uh, but also to be able, because the standards support the revisions and the revisions are necessary as measurement evolves and so forth. So the, if, you know, so rather we don't want this to be the last version because things are gonna change. And so, so how do we, again, it's one of the things that we are facing with open access journals, right? How do we, in fact, support um, publishing, getting research out there, while at the same time making research much more accessible to the general public? And, and the standards are facing that same problem, that more general problem. So with that, let us close the session. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for the presenters. Thank you.